Okay, welcome everybody to another Primary Innovation webinar. Thanks again to John James for uh, his support in organising these and for Ikiko coordinating the speakers. Um, today we're lucky enough to have uh, Bruce Small presenting on some early insights from an analysis of the ongoing co-innovation projects that have been a central part of the Primary Innovation Programme and understanding the, the lessons that we've learned from each of those projects around how co-innovation can happen and the potential benefits from it. And Bruce has very rightly pointed out, um, he's had help from Melissa Robson from Landcare Research and Penny Payne here at AgriSearch, as well as a cast of many others, um, including the project leaders, the reflexive monitors, and many, many others. So thank you very much, Bruce, for putting this presentation together, and I'll hand over to you now. Okay, thanks James, John and Kiko for organising everything and um, welcome everybody. Um, uh, as I said, it's, I, my, uh, my um, colleagues have helped me do this, Melissa and Penny Payne and um, as James says, uh, the cast of a hundreds and flex of monitors, team leaders, participants and the workshop, various workshops etc. So thanks to everybody everyone for that. Um, this is the outline of the presentation. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the New Zealand Primary Sector, the Co-Innovation Project, and I'm going to look at two projects in particular and compare them through the integration and implementation science framework, and I'll tell you what that's all about. But first I'll talk about the core concepts of co-innovation and, and uh, how co-innovation was used within the Primary Innovation Programme. I look at uh, the integration and implementation science framework next, which is um, referred to as the I2S framework. I'll look at the similarities and differences between co-innovation and I2S, and then I'll do a preliminary com comparison across these two projects. And um, here I say it's preliminary because this, is, this process is uh, um, still underway. We're still analysing the data and still resolving exactly how we should do things. And then finally, I'll wind up with a bit of a discussion. Okay, so um, I guess you're all involved in the New Zealand Primary Co-Innovation Programme anyway, so you'll have a good understanding of this, that our primary exports are very important to the New Zealand sector, and the government wants to increase innovation and adoption by farmers in the primary sector to better enhance, maximise economic benefits seems to be the primary um, out, outcome. But um, co-innovation that we hope will produce research that is more fit for purpose and produce more fit for purpose innovations, which we hope will produce better adoption. So um, the primary innovation uh, programme is uh, the aims of it are to take an agricultural innovation approach to stimulate the New Zealand agricultural sector, to in influence the national innovation system, and we also hope to be able to um, evaluate the processes and outcomes of the co-innovation projects, and this is part of that process in a way. Um, there were six primary innovation projects, but this presentation focuses on two, as I mentioned. Um, the first one we'll look at, or, or, or project will be the Nutrient Management Project. This was a, an initiative of Dairy NZ um, to coordinate actions in the Canterbury region and to support farmers as they face new water quality regulations. The project started in 2012 um, and uh, um, it's an ideal project for co-innovation because it has a number of the qualities that um, we believe are uh, require a co-innovative approach, and that is it's a complex problem, um, trying to reduce environmental footprints while maintaining production. Um, there are a, a large number of people or parties that are involved that need to be part of the solution, and that who will be affected by the solution, and um, the solution requires actions from um, all levels of the innovation system and, and a primary system in the country. The next project is a tomato potato psyllid project. The aim here is to develop control for the um, TTP, I don't quite know how you say that, Clozo bacterium to assist the New Zealand potato industry to again realise export growths. 
Um, this, uh, the TPP became a major problem for New Zealand in 2008, it produces zebra chip disease. The industry clearly needs and wants solutions as quickly as possible. This project commenced on October 2013 and the primary innovation project became involved with the project in June 2014, so there was a bit of a delay in, uh, um, in, in uh, primary innovation becoming involved with the project and it started. There are three primary science objectives um, and one knowledge transfer objective. The, the science are objectives are looking at sensory cues associated with the facility, um, looking at population, um, genetics variability amongst the little critter there and looking at host plant responses to the critter. Um, the fourth research aim, which um, is knowledge transfer, did not originally have a, um, a, a, a team leader aside to that project. Really what they were looking at is uh, um, at program completion they would deliver a science solution and tech transfer would carry the project out to the end users. Okay, now the core concepts of co-innovation are um, a collaboration, coordination, complementarity. So um, it's a collaborative pro process where things converge by complementarity is meant a similar thing to co-evolution. That is that various components of the system have to converge or meet somewhere along, so that might include institutional rule, rules, you know, the policy makers, um, it might include industry, it might include stakeholders, the end users, um, and, and of course researchers. Um, values may need to be co-created or converged during the project. Co-learning and social learning is also uh, um, a, a, a characteristic of co-innovation, where the different parties learn from each other about um, how they view the problem and how they view the potential solutions. Um, brokering um, is often required in the process to um, involve the appropriate people and move the information to the appropriate people. Also reflexivity um, is, a, is a key part which um, enables adaptive management of the project. Um, in the primary innovation project, co-innovation was um, centred on the role of research in co-innovation. Um, and here again, it's been defined that co-innovation is most suited to complex research problems. Um, we are taking a systemic approach to it. Social networks have also been examined within the primary co-innovation project. Um, there's a component of upscaling and outscaling in the agri-food sector, which is being that was the last presentation by Sam, talked about that. Um, Co-innovation is treated as context specific and adaptive. Uh, knowledge and innovation broking have, have been a part and Barbara King has um, included that as part of the uh, uh, network analysis material. Monitoring and evaluation are an important part of the project um, and that has been taken care of by uh, um, Jeff Coots and T um, Tony have, have instigated that. Uh, then there is uh, reflexivity and reflex, reflexive monitors in the project. Reflexive monitors are a special role in the co-innovation projects to kind of help facilitate the group processes and, and keep the project, co-innovation projects with their eye on what their ambition for change is. Um, uh, a, a, um, the concept of the five principles of co-innovation um, was particularly related to this project, the primary innovation, they're more like behavioural characteristics. They were originally, they were reduced from an original set of nine um, that were discussed by um, Kurt et al in, in, um, in some papers already published. Okay, so the int integration implementation science framework, it's a bit of a mouthful, I2S is kind of easier. Um, this is, was originated by Professor Gabriel Bama from ANU University in Australia. It's a framework for turning problem definition and solution generation and implementation of complex real world problems into a scientific discipline. So 
basically Gabriel wants to um, create a science of how to do transdisciplinary science, how to solve the pressing complex real world problems that we face. Um, these include not only things like innovation uh, um, or um, projects which are aimed at increasing uh, um, value, but also things like climate change, crime, um, etc. So basically it's a system that's set up to look at what works and when, and the concept here is that hindsight leads to insight and foresight. So that in the future we'll be able to do better if there's a, um, a systematic process for collecting the data and understanding what we've done through our, um, our, through our transdisciplinary research, then we should be able to um, better foresight how to use it in the future. The framework is non-prescriptive. It just asks questions about how the research approaches are, are, are being used. And of course, um, as we, I said before, it's for complex real world problems, which are defined as problems which have um, mo operate in multiple different systems which affect each other with um, sort of uh, um, fluid boundaries between those systems. Uh, they also involve multiple scientific disciplines. There might be a degree of scientific uncertainty and as well as a number of unknown factors that influence the outcomes and impacts of the projects and the research. Um, there are a, a, a range of different affected stakeholders who all might have um, different end goals, um, desired end goals, different values, and some of which both values and end goals may be in conflict. Um, also, uh, a problem becomes uh, another aspect of comp problem complexity, real world problem complexity is if there is a high degree of system stability or lock-in and that can be either technological, political, financial, social, cultural, normative or behavioural. Um, the framework has three domains and five questions within those domains. Um, the first domain is the domain of synthesising disciplinary and stakeholder knowledge, which is about gathering the evidence, um, jointly defining what the problem is so that you get a complete picture of the problem as well as co-generating, co-developing the solutions to the problem. Um, as we noted before, in complex real world problems, there are often a lot of unknowns or uncertainties and so the next um, domain of the framework is what do, how, how are people, looks at how are people handling those uncertainties. Some of those unknowns and uncertainties, some unknowns will be the hypotheses that are trying to be reduced or um, understood in the project and the research. Others, other unknowns will be things that um, are emergent during or after the project um, in the context of the project which um, might make for unexpected or um, consequences or unexpected or unanticipated consequences. And uh, the third domain is about how does the research um, provide integrated support for the implementation of the results to get change in the world. So that's making it happen basically. Um, the four questions that she asks are for what and for whom and they can be, these, these five questions at least can be applied to each of three, these three domains. So, and that's what makes the basic framework. So, uh, um, so for, who, for what and for whom is a question which asks, okay, who are the beneficiaries? Of, of this project and what are the outcomes that are, are, are hopefully going to be, be achieved for the beneficiaries. Um, what's needed in that, in that system refers to what, do you, what bits of knowledge and information, stakeholders, et cetera, are needed in order to um, be able to generate solutions and implement those solutions. Um, how is, what kind of processes do you use? Are they recognised standard tools or what kind of tools um, have been used to generate the information that's needed? Then, um, then there is the context, which is um, the important social, economic, political, etc. context in which the projects are occurring, 
which might affect it, and, and these may change during the course of the project. So, for example, you may have, you know, um, a global downturn in economics, which would, which might affect um, how the research could be implemented. Outcomes here does not refer to outcomes in terms of impacts, but it's really a question which looks reflectively back on the other three questions to see how well did all of that work um, for, uh, for the project. Um, I've, I've gone through some of the literature and looked at some of the um, similarities and differences between I2S and co-innovation, and so here's, I've listed some characteristics down one side, and um, as you can see, there's, there's a lot of the same stuff happening, both in I2S and in the um, primary co-innovation project. So in both of them, we have collaborative processes, co-creation occurring, we have stakeholder inclusion, we have co-evolution along knowledge, technologies, institutions, and values, a system perspective is taking, Brokering is um, uh, is considered to be uh, an important part. Social learning is an important part of both processes. Both processes um, uh, emphasise context sensitivity, be, to be aware of the context in which they occur. Um, they also emphasise the value of reflection and reflective practice in order to um, adaptively manage the process to make it the most appropriate um, for how things are working out. Both processes are non-linear, they require iterative approaches to, to, being, to doing them, so although the framework looks, is presented in a linear fashion, it's supposed to be conducted in, um, um, in an iterative, iterative processes. They both involve monitoring and evaluation. Um, the five principles of co-innovation that we uh, um, have developed, been developed in PI are, are more or less implicit in the I2S framework. Um, they are both for addressing real-world problems, although co-innovation mostly has is mostly focused on business opportunities and business development, whereas uh, um, the I2S framework includes not only business processes but also um, wider complex real world issues such as climate change or crime or social um, social circumstances such as poverty etc. Um, they both have, um, well, there's, uh, there's a big focus on managing of diverse unknowns in the I2S and there is some, a partial focus of this in the co-innovation process too. Um, both projects support implementation of project outcomes, in fact that's one of the kind of the aims of both of them. Um, there are some specialist roles in, uh, um, in I2S and, and there are some kind of com comparable roles in innovation too. So you have in I2S, you have an I2S disciplinary specialist and in co-innovation you have a reflexive monitor who plays a very similar role. And of course the innovation team leader and research team members are also, it's also fairly important that they are on board with the concept of co-innovation or I2S in order for these, um, these frameworks or processes to um, really work well. Um, the I2S off, offers a comprehensive systematic framework which is for both for planning, for analysis, adaptation, documentation, implementation and evaluation of um, the problems and the solutions generated. Whereas co-innovation seems to be more of a toolbox of methods and process, processes and seems to be um, kind of organically evolving over time as, as researchers put the process into practice. So at this stage, I'm just wondering if anybody has um, any questions that they would like to ask for a brief pause. So folks, yeah, if you've got any questions, please type them in the, the box, the questions box, and I'll pass them on. Um, while folks are doing that, the question that I have for you, Bruce, is um, if you've sort of picked up any um, differences between the role of an I2S disciplinary specialist and the role of a reflexive monitor? Well, um, one thing about the I2S disciplinary um, specialist is that they're supposed to be um, 
an interdisciplinarian, um, which I guess also actually helps if you're a reflexive monitor too, but that's a kind of a particular focus and in fact Gabriel is trying to make this a science of how to do transdisciplinary research. Um, so uh, um, that science itself, that discipline, I2S, um, ha ha just as there are disciplinary specialists in other disciplines, the um, I2S person is a disciplinary specialist in how to do transdisciplinary science. And I think the, um, the reflexive monitor is, in, is actually in such a, a somewhat similar position, but without such an emphasis on the interdisciplinarity, I think, perhaps. I don't know, do other people have any perspectives on that? Oh, I can't ask you questions, can I? No, unfortunately, Bruce. Um, we'll see if anybody types in an answer to that question. Um, just no questions at this stage, but I'll, I'll interrupt with another one of my own around, okay, we've got one from Niels. Um, Niels asks, I2S seems constructivist and primary innovation quite reductionist in nature. Could they be um, complementary frameworks rather than opposing? I don't see them as opposing at all. I see lots of, I, I don't know that I see that um, um, co-innovation is really set up as a framework at present, um, as a step, systemic framework. Um, I, I think that I think that you can use I to S to um, help with co-innovation projects right from the start, from the design, because really you're you're actually looking to do quite a lot of the same kind of things, and um, uh, uh, and it's about in the end um, creating impact from the research. And it's um, how to go about it. Lots of they use lots of the same processes, and they even kind of document similar tools. So uh, they're kind of quite similar things. But I I haven't anywhere seen a um, you know a kind of co-innovation laid out as a framework. So uh, for me, that seems to be the major difference. Okay, that's um, uh, Neil's is happy with that answer. Very good answer, Bruce. Um, no other questions at this stage, and I suspect it's the case of many are interested to sort of hear from you Head on the results. preliminary results. Yeah, so yeah. I'll hand back to you to carry on. Okay, thank you. Okay, so one of the things that um, um, that co-innovation that we were considering in the primary innovation program that co-innovation would be most used for is problems of you know increasing degrees of complexity, and so. Um, we were interested in, uh, you know, what does complexity mean? Um, we had a brief de definition above before in from the I2S framework, and interestingly enough, from the co-innovation space, um, they have a similar kind of uh, um, a, a bit of a definition. That's where there is, a, a, you know, a problem is complex if there is high disagreement. Um, between the various stakeholders or participants in the process, if there is um, high scientific uncertainty, um, and also if there is a high systemic stability or lock-in on things. So, so pretty much, um, Arkestein um, and Co have a very similar concept to what makes projects complex. Um, to what Gabriel and the I2S framework have. So, um, in the middle you will see a little uh, um, spider graph which looks at those three aspects or uh, which we had a little questionnaire which we used at the um, Primary Innovation Workshop in February to look at these three dimensions of complexity in each of the projects and we had the project teams fill them out. Now, one reason that we're looking at comparing these two projects um, is because they had an extremely similar profile in in um, complexity, um, uh, being quite similar on all of the all of the different dimensions and having a similar overall score. Um, so that means we've got a similar kind of two sim similar sorts of projects, at least from complexity, which is considered to be um, uh, one of the crucial elements of why you would use. Um, co-innovation or the I2S framework. Um, 
interestingly enough, or I haven't got them on here, but the other fr the other pro uh, other projects were complex in different ways. That is, they had varying degrees of complexity and scientific uncertainty or system lock-in, but they all had kind of somewhat similar total complexity scores, even though they differed in the dimensions of complexity. Um, now, this is just a, um, a data sheet that I'll show you that um, some those of you who were at the uh, workshop in February will remember filling this out. Um, I'm not expecting anyone to read any of this at the moment. It's obviously too much information, but it's just to show you that, you know, we sat in the workshop and we collected this information from the teams. We got them to type the information in there. Um, so that's the basic information that we're starting off that we're, that we're working from. Um, the next thing that we did, and this was mainly done by Melissa and I, um, with um, some consultation with Gabriel, um, although we are still working through this process a bit, we deconstructed um, the, the probes, the question probes for, we have the main questions over there and then we have the question probes and then in the last slide you'll have seen the, the responses were in, in here, in this column. Um, here we've, again, um, Melissa and I have deconstructed these probes um, to, to get kind of, to produce the elements for each of the primary questions that are being looked at by the, by the probe. So we've identified all those elements and um, that looks a bit like this when you look at the number of elements in each primary question. So, so there's um, across the different domains, there's, there's a slightly different number of elements sometimes being addressed. The, the big one is uh, the, the question two, which is about the systems and the, the, uh, um, and the processes and, um, and the stakeholders and knowledge disciplines needed um, in there. Um, and you can see that across um, uh, domain one, across all, uh, um, there's, there's 25 elements, across domain two, 12, across domain th three, 23 elements. So this together, this makes 60, um, 60 elements of the I2S framework that you can um, identify to address or, or consider whether they were important and needed or it should be, or how they were, how you're going to address them. In, in a particular project. Um, so here, this is our, our data analysis sheet, where you can see we've got the, um, the elements down there for each of the primary questions. Uh, then we have, um, we've gone through, done a sort of a qualitative analysis of the responses um, put in by the, um, the, the co-invasion project teams. We've extracted, um, bits of information or summarize some of it and then we have um, given it a, given their responses a rating uh, from zero to four as to whether they were at zero being absent and four being strongly present um, so if those elements were strongly addressed they would have very strongly addressed they would get a four if they're moderately present they get um, a, a two etc so um, that's just the, the example of the um, data analysis spreadsheet that we used. Here we get more into results. And um, so this is the results for domain one, which is about synthesizing disciplinary and stakeholder knowledge. Um, so we can see um, that there are differences in the scores between um, the potato tomato potato salad project and the nutrient management. Here we have the scores for each of those um, uh, primary questions as to um, how absent or present they were addressed. Um, this is, these scores are an average of the elements that were associated with that question and, and its probes. Um, so here you can see that the, uh, um, the both of them clearly identified their purposes, although the tomato and the TPP was primarily focused around um, biological science and disciplinary experts um, 
whereas nutrient management had uh, had uh, more involvement with um, stakeholders and end users and industry. Um, um, the biological systems were considered, but not so much social systems. Um, stakeholders weren't represented initially, and value differences were only marginally uh, managed. Um, no real evidence of um, uh, of tools to conduct these kind of or do these kind of things. Whereas um, it, it, there were recognised tools, systems analysis and models were conducted in um, nutrient management. Um, there were decisions made about disciplinary and stakeholder inclusions. Um, values and framing differences did emerge, um, and these were managed. However, that process was dominated a little, a little bit by dairy and Z, and farmers' views on the systems were not explicitly sought, but seemed to have emerged. In fact, farmers were engaged once the program gained funding rather than in the bidding process. However, other stakeholders, industry stakeholders, were engaged during the bidding process too, in writing it up. Um, so how was the knowledge synthesis? Question three, good disciplinary science, no formal synthesis methods. Um, and little synthesis across disciplines. So um, a, a relatively low score on that one. Um, however, the nutrient management team used multiple methods of synthesis and described them. Um, and who it was led by, um, the, um, and and reflexivity was Im embedded across the process for for knowledge synthesis. Um, context and circumstances, there was some consideration in, in that tomato potato facility, and there was a, a a meeting held sort of three years into the program. Um, where where stakeholders were involved and some legit legitimacy was sought for what the program was doing. Um, whereas in nutrient management, there was a range of contexts were considered um, and actions, some actions taken to, to address these. Legitimacy and authorization was through the involvement of reputable and influential organizations. Um, for an overall domain score, it was a relatively low for the tomato potato facility and um, reasonably high for the nutrient management. Um, this is about managing diverse unknowns, domain two. So you have the kind of list of questions about what we're really considering or, or really is being looked into here. Again, um, the tomato potato facility group um, gave this issue some consideration. The primary focus was on reducing known unknowns, that is science, bio, biological hypothesis. And um, they did use processes to recognize processes to do that. In the nutrient management project, um, again, biophysical hypothesis as well as social hypotheses, which are the known unknowns. And there was also um, a significant risk under analysis taken, which, uh, which was uh, to try and um, um, make them ready for um, uh, recognizing emergent um, issues. Um, again, focus on biological organisms, etc. Um, uh, hypothesis plus good identification of potential risks. Um, question three, how were unknowns being managed? Um, in, in the tomato potato salad, this was um, primarily a disciplinary rather than interdisciplinary, and there weren't any use of any specific tools. Um, however, towards the latter stages so far of the project, the reflexive monitor and the business management have tried to encourage the pickup of, uh, of these kind of um, processes and tools. Um, nutrient management, on, a, on the other hand, had identified a wide range of tools that they used. Um, and of course, reflective practice is, is one of the major methods of picking up on, uh, well, reflection is one of the major methods of picking up on emergent unknowns and then using reflective practices to adaptively manage it is the appropriate response. Um, to the context and, and circumstances, some was consideration was given to the to the context by the tomato potato project. Um, and 
uh, and a somewhat similar, maybe slightly more, was given to it in the nutri nutrient management project, with um, differences in values and names being um, being identified. Um, and a, a process using government's committee to help address those. Um, so the overall scores that we gave, 1.5 um, for the, the main two, for the tomato and potatoes fillers, and three for the nutrient management uh, um, process. This is the main three, uh, providing integrated research support for policy and practice change. Um, again, there was clear impact statements. Um, pretty much from relatively here from both groups, although uh, stakeholder engagement um, and industry engagement differed between the two projects um, regarding the aspects of policy or practice change that were being targeted through most of the pro most of the TPP. Um, no implementation pathway other than tech transfer, which was to be considered at the end of the project, was really considered. Um, however, in the nutrient management, a very proactive approach was taken to uh, um, to this with stakeholder analysis, program logic for um, you know what impacts were expected, um, risk analysis um, was developed, and there were a bunch of different meetings and workshops for looking at that um, regarding how the um, integrated research was. Um, provided. Um, here in TPP, it's implicit acceptance of a linear technology transfer process. And industry bodies were identified as being the mechanisms or the agents through which that process would occur. Um, however, there was little engaged with them with them for a long time into the pro project. Um, and that engagement with them has only really started in um, uh, three years after the project began. And uh, um, and only really maybe beginning to think about how to do that now. Uh, um, whereas for nutrient management, there were some um, communications plans, delivery plans, engagement methods were all defined, uh, defined, and they had connecting steps between them too. So it's a very deliberative process um, to enhance uptake. Um, the context for TPP, new players came into the industry bodies, such as um, you know a new CEO of FAR or, or, and um, Potato NZ, I think it was, um, and there was increased pressure on um, researchers for solutions to the bio, biophysical problems. Um, the reflexive monitor and and um, business manager has been trying to encourage project team engagement with industry need end users. So um, for nutrient management, um, there's been um, consideration given to the changing context, um, and there's been legitimacy, legitimacy of Im implementation um, via credible industry bodies. Um, there have been issues of IP and, and um, differences in, in partner and project uh, uh, members. Regarding that, the overall scores were 1.2 for TT, TPP and uh, 3.1 for nutrient management. Um, we drew some little spider graphs again, um, thanks to Penny, who did this for me. Um, so we here we've looked at um, each domain and the four questions and how the two different um, projects responded to them. So you can see that um, the, T uh, the uh, nutrient, manage pro nutrient management project across all of the domains pretty much focus more on all of the, all of the um, primary questions um, than did the um, TPP project. There was a similar score there on that one for providing integrated research on, and that's in the definition of um, what it was all about and who for, etc. Um, this particular one, this spider graph here, it looks at at um, the two innovation projects, and somehow I seem to have lost my key there, but. Two innovation projects. The the orange one is um, nutrient management, and the blue one is TPP. So that looks at um, 
you know, how how many, how many of the elements from each of those domains were um, were absent or present um, in the two projects, and so you can see that there was. Uh, nutrient management, as was clear from the tables, um, was placing a lot more focus in, in each of these domains than um, than TPP. Although some there was some degree, of course, in TPP across all of them. So, as a general kind of result of it. Um, both projects tended to score rel relatively well in the for what and for whom category. They, they had that reasonably well specified. Um, you know, they both knew what the central problem was. They both had some idea of what some of the unknowns were at least, and and some and some uh, um, in, in the TP uh, in the nutrient man management they had particular strategy for dealing with the unknown unknowns or the the. And the um, and also the potential risks, um, and they both knew what kind of policy or practice change that they were trying to achieve. Um, similarly, they both identified next and end users, um, stakeholders, partners, and other key contexts. However, these questions are critical in the science paradigm anyway, especially in the funding process. So you pretty much have to do it when you put a bid in. So. Um, I guess that's why they both absolutely did it. Um, the contrast between the nutrient management and the and the TPP projects tended uh, um, tended to have the biggest difference in schools in the how category. So nutrient management tended to use a diverse number of tools, um, um, used a wide range of tools. In fact, um, what, whereas the um, TPP project used a much narrower, took a much narrower systems view, and um, and a linear technology approach, technology transfer approach, and um, did not um, use um, um, a number of tools which are available, which could potentially have helped them. Uh, um, see how their project, how, how how their biological science fitted in with um, end user behaviour perspectives. So um, nutrient management was more focused on domain three than um, clearly more focused on domain three than um, than was the the um, TPP project. Okay, so. You know, I guess the question is: Is is there any value in using co-innovation through the um, looking at, at co-innovation through an I2S lens? And these are my kind of um, takes on that. I think that for the co-innovation projects, uh, um, that this is a process that enables systematic reflection, and also it enables you you could conceivably document all these issues. So that would enable standardised documentation, so that you can then look across projects to see what was done where, when, what or what wasn't done um, in a first instance. Um, so, um, and and this helps makes the projects and the um, project documentation relevant to other transdisciplinary researchers. If it contains lots of information about the methods, the processes, and the tools that were used, and even evaluation of the tools, how well they worked. So this helps to build up um, a body of knowledge for, you know, for transdisciplinary science. For the, for the primary innovation project, the, the structured framework um, allows a comparison and evaluation of the tools or methods across the projects. It's suitable for a cross-case analysis. And also, collection of this kind of data may be useful or provide a foundation for future retrospective assessment of the methods and tools um, and their utility for um, in, with specific types of complex problems. For transdisciplinary science in general, the, the value of using I2S across a co-innovation is that the, it provides a framework for designing, adaptively managing, Implementing, documenting, and evaluating the tools, methods, processes, and contexts. 
for addressing these complex real world problems. Um, I've just one more slide, which is a little slide which talks just I'm talking about issues in, in using the I2S framework, I guess. And first of all, it's quite tricky to collect data. That's because um, it's quite complex, really. It takes people a little while to get their head around the ideas. As all of the people in the co-innovation project will know, that was that was also an issue for co-innovation. Um, when you do it in retrospect, like we did in this particular case, there are issues of memory about what you did, interpret interpretation of, of what you did even. Um, it might be emotionally challenging for people or projects to consider what they have done or what they haven't done to, and it takes you know a relative amount of time to do. Um, so it's it's quite co cognitively complex, and it we we needed um, when we did it with the uh, with the I with the primary innovation project at the workshop in January, we found it quite necessary to. Uh, um, uh, to have a, a, a facilitator for the process. Multiple judges are required um, in order to, you know, have credibility on the interpretations of scores that you saw that we, we've done that in, in there, so um, that's an issue. It's, um, it's, it's useful if you can quantify these variables because that can help you demonstrate um, their value. However, it, it's still difficult to do that, you know, what are your value criteria, what about the counterfactuals in the process, you know, how can you make a comparison, you know, it's not like you've got two, um, uh, two controlled experiments. Um, another issue that might arise is uh, over the time of the project's context may have changed, may well have changed before, long term impacts are anywhere near to come out. So there's just a few little issues that I've noticed. And that's pretty much over from me now. Great, thank you very much, Bruce. That was a um, fantastic way to frame up the comparison of those two uh, projects out of the six that are in the Prime Innovation Program. So, still got a few, um, couple of minutes for um, a couple of questions if people have them. So, please put them in the in the box there in the question box. Box, and I'll just pass on Bruce a uh, feedback from Jeff. Coots who appreciated the reflection and walk through the project and the insights that you'd provided. Perhaps just while we're um, waiting for questions, uh, so Niels has got what's the next step, Bruce? What are the next steps? Okay. Um, well, we're uh, um, we're we're looking at the the I2S framework and a number of um, other and some other projects. Projects too in the Cell One and Y Hora um, uh, water management process in the Canterbury, um, and what we've already we've already gathered stuff because it was done a year or so ago. We've already gathered information from policymakers and end users of the process and the research. So now we're looking, uh, um, and and that is what we would eventually like to do in um, in in primary innovation too. So you know, if there's um, if there's follow up in a year's time or things like that, then we can start to look at um, how well um, the policymakers and end users thought ha ha what how what they thought of the product that was produced by these um, different processes. You know, I think it's quite good that in the primary innovation project we've got sort of a lot of variation in how the um, how co-innovation or um, I2S elements were addressed, so that you know, so that we've got variation between the projects, so we can look and see. Hopefully, in a in a, a year or so's time, we can look and see has that made any difference on um, on the kind of product that was delivered to the end users and their perceptions. So that's kind of one of our the main areas for future investigation. Great, thank you very much, Bruce. Um, and thank you for that excellent presentation. I look forward to seeing more of those spider diagrams for the other projects that you'll be analysing in the Prime Innovation Programme. Thank you everybody for your attendance and again to John and Akiko for organising this. If you do have more questions, feel free to send through an email to Bruce. Um, thank you much everybody and have a good day.